Welcome to the second part. Again, as I had said at the end of the previous one, this is all meant to be one piece, but I want to try and keep these things shorter rather than longer. And when I got to editing it, it's just a case of this is too long. So apologies for the weird break part. And just remember, we were talking about the opening night of the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, which is the 27th of December, 1904. Let's move on from there. That first night was hugely successful. Having had an Irish Literary Theatre Manifesto earlier and then an Irish National Theatre Manifesto, they'd finally turned it into a real thing. Now, this is largely due to Annie Horniman and we're going to end the Fay Brothers. Do we remember Horniman and the Fay Brothers so much in Irish history? Not really as much as we might because they both left early. Annie Horniman was very, very strict about the political side and they were always trying to get around her. And on the night of Edward VII's death in 1908, sorry, in 1909, when every other theater in Dublin closed its doors, remember Ireland was still a part of the United Kingdom at the point, when every other theater closed its doors and the uh, Annie Horniman expected it to close her its doors too, she being a proud English woman. Lennox Robinson, who had taken over running the theatre in 1909, kept them open. That was it. Horniman, over the space of a couple of years, disentangled herself from it. And Yeats, through a bit of shrewd manipulation, managed to get rid of, uh, get the theatre for a very cheap price. It had great intentions to start. Uh, George Russell didn't really produce very many plays for it, but he was a good supporter. Uh, but they did get in quite a few significant pieces of work. In fact, George Bernard Shaw, uh, they, I think, produced one play by him, but they had commissioned him to write the opening play. Shaw, at this stage, had become quite successful as a playwright. And so, as Ireland's biggest playwright still living in uh, Britain, they, Yeats had sent off to him to get, to get him a play called John Bull's Other Island. Now, reading afterwards, it's entertaining. Yeats said that Shaw's play was too long, had too many characters, and it was beyond their capabilities to produce at the time. Shaw said that he'd been asked by a group of people who wanted something poetic and um, aspirational. He wanted to present Ireland in its reality. Uh, as they say in Ireland, doctors differ, patients die. Other important figures at this time. Oh yes, the Fays. Why did the Fays leave? The Fays got into a bit of a fight over uh, how the theatre was to be run with Yeats in 1908. The two of them uh, set off for the United States and went on to live there. I believe, I can't recall correctly, uh, I believe Sarah Allgood stayed. Now, Sarah Allgood is an interesting figure. This is 1908 that everybody else skipped off. She played the lead role in The Playboy of the Western World in 1907. Willie Fay directing, J.M. Singh writing, and it's still probably the signature play of the earliest years of the Abbey Theatre. And she became the first really great actress within the theatre who has the name of being an Abbey actress. I remember what I was saying about the size of the shape of the theatre. When I was growing up, Irish acting was a little bit cringy to me. It was very declamatory. It was very much a case of, I'll say my beautiful words, oh, and so they are, they're words of a peasant people in a, who are aspiring to more in spite of the English. And then I walk, and then I continue to speak. And bearing in mind, this was a theatre of poets and, uh, and writers. It suited all these people so well to continue to write for a stage that was that narrow, which would force the emphasis on the words rather than anything else. This stage stayed in place to 1951 when it was burnt down. And it was replaced in 1966 uh, by what is now the current Abbey Theatre. It's still being worked on, and it has been for years, uh, to be renovated or replaced, but it will it'll be going on for decades more, I have a feeling. 
That original Abbey Theatre, however, was to prove epochal. It changed Irish theatre. Perhaps we moved back away from the pure naturalism that Macklin aspired to. Maybe we skipped past the whole Chekhovian or um, uh, Stanislavski move movement. There were Stanislavski theatres in Dublin later, but at this point it was very declamatory and very much poetical. So we have a few things to note. Uh, it becomes the first theatre to be uh, a state-funded theatre. We had uh, independence in 1922 and then civil war practically immediately after. But the uh, Minister for Finance in 1923, I think it is, uh, a guy called uh, Ernest Bly, he was Minister for Finance from 1923 to 1932. And he, in spite of the difficulties and the stress upon the state, in spite of his uh, mission to keep the books balanced, managed to find £850 a year in order to fund the Abbey Theatre. It is not unsurprising that later on in life, uh, between 1941 and 1967, with his political career past him, he was made the managing director of the Abbey. This is not the best period for the Abbey. Generally speaking, while a lot of playwrights got their first chance under Bly, uh, the plays weren't great a lot of the time. He very, very much was, again, about balancing the books, and he wanted to produce comedies all the time because that was what the people wanted. Uh, in one, at one point in the late 50s or early 60s, he remarked that on rejecting a play, he didn't care for plays with ghosts in them which led to one of our later playwrights, Hugh Leonard, saying, well, there goes Hamlet. Latterly in the Abbey Theatre, there was, uh, on hunting around in it, they realised there was a decent sized space downstairs called the Peacock. And they used that in many ways for uh, developing young actors and to rent out as a theatre space. That will come into play when we talk about the gate. But the Peacock, at a certain point after the 20s, became more interesting. Throughout the 20s, we replaced our sort of peasant plays with more politically astute fare. Lennox Robinson had taken over from Willie Fay. He had quit in 1914 after the theatre had gone on a very unsuccessful tour of the United States. And so we end up coming back and trying to focus on what we're doing at home. You know the kind of way we need to make the money back. And it didn't work out so well. At this point in the late 20s, we see Yeats's influence becoming more and more assertive there. Lady Gregory is still the main voice, but Yeats is doing all the hard work. One of the things he did was he attempted to set up the Abbey School of uh, Acting. So the Abbey School of Acting was basically him pulling anybody he knew who had any experience from all around back. The key person for me was a woman called Ninette de Valois. She was an Irish-born woman who had moved to Britain and had become the principal, one of the principal ballerinas of her time before becoming one of the principal ballet teachers of her time in Britain. She came back <clears throat> And for about five years, did incredible work setting up the Abbey Ballet School, which was the first ballet school on the island, and also helping to develop a lot of the acting as well. Unfortunately, after about five years, she moved on, which is very understandable. She went on to basically live till, I think, was it 1990 in Britain, uh, living to a ripe old age. I think she was in her 90s. And... Uh, became made a dame of and all the accolades and was still towards her, her dying days, a significant voice in British theater and British ballet. In terms of the Abbey, Yeats wrote plays specifically for her. Things like the King of the Great Clock Tower was written with her in mind and dedicated to her. It was there with her and with others that the Abbey Ballet and the Abbey acting school were created. 
And this sort of crystallized our idea of that Abbey theater acting style. Again, it feels to me passe and outdated, but you wouldn't want to mind me. I think that's true of the systems of rehearsal of uh, Stanislavski. I want to round off with four different plays that were incredibly significant in the Irish theater as they started out. Playboy of the Western World by J.M. Singh, 1907. It caused riots because during the play, there was reference to a shift. Now, a shift was an item of ladies' undergar uh, undergarmentage, generally pretty shapeless. But for some of those in the audience, this was too much. This was too sexual a thing to be talking about. It had a secondary rev reference. Uh, there was a scandal in 1891. Yes, year, this long later and longer beyond, people are still talking about it. Charles Stuart Parnell uh, became, let us say, entangled with a married woman called Kitty O'Shea. And this entanglement uh, led to a court case wherein the word shift was used in the court case. Now, Parnell was a very, very popular figure, but this proved divisive. And mentioning this in a play was to incite the wrath of people who were upset about the split, which was most people. Uh, another play that I think is important for a similar reason is Plough in the Stars from 1926. It was Sean O'Casey who became a major player involved in the Abbey in the later years. It was his uh, last great play produced for the first time at the Abbey. It's set during the Irish War of Independence and it was seen as scandalous and caused riots. Again, riots, only 20 years later. It caused riots when it depicted the plough and the stars, which was the flag of the Irish worker, and the tricolour in a bar. This was seen to be uh, shaming and um, desecration of these great flags. Uh, I believe Yates, that was the play that Yates went out, and I'll put up the proper quote when this is on YouTube, and said, you've shamed yourselves again. This play was huge, and while it's difficult to stage, the Abbey regularly does it, up until recently at least, while it is difficult to stage, it is one of his most rewarding ensemble pieces, and it's probably the first piece of theatre in Ireland that you can say is truly Chekhovian. His earlier piece, Juno and the Paycock, is very much in my mind an Ibsenian piece, while I would argue that um, the uh, Shadow of a Gunman which was 1925, I believe, or 1923, I disrecall. Uh, Shadow of a Gunman was, in my mind, uh, Strindbergian in several ways. Last one I want to talk about is John Bull's Other Island. Yes, the play, it's only the play the Abbey Theatre could have been. Shaw was very supportive, and several of his plays were pr produced early on, but Shaw, for some reason, was never taken as Irish the same way that, say, Oscar Wilde was. Shaw, however, maintained his Irish accent to his death and was very, very uh, much an Irishman, even when Ireland had separated from Britain and he li was living happily in St. Aylots in, uh, near London. But John Bull's Other Island was an interesting piece where an Irishman who has gone to Britain and let's say, shredded his history in order to fit uh, better, somewhat like Charles Macklin. He and an associate from Britain come back to his old uh, homestead and see about buying an investment of land there. While it was not to be for him in Dublin, this play secured him as being the preeminent playwright of Britain at that time. And, oh, I didn't mention that Ambalia Strand. Yes, Ambalia Strand is another one of here's what the Abbey could have been. The Abbey Theatre went on to be a theatre of peasants and rural Ireland and really did not reflect much on what was going on in the city. The city at this time in Ireland, city life was occupied by maybe 25 to 30 percent of the population. Most people lived rurally. So it made sense to be a, a theatre of the peasants. Yeats's aspiration was it to be a, was to have it a, a poetic theatre and a theatre of myth and uh, Irish lore and aspiration, not the broad comedies that we were to get later from the likes of Lennox Robinson, not that there's anything wrong with them, or the uh, family dramas of T.C. Murray. Again, not that there's anything wrong with them. But his plays always aspired to a poetic medium 
that was not what the Abbey was to become. Despite it opening and being, in some senses, one of the best of the first uh, few plays on the stage, it was certainly, I would say, is a better play than Spreading the News or Kathleen Nihulahan, and certainly more interesting. Spreading the News simply is more entertaining, and that's what the Irish theatre became. Lady Gregory, not a great writer, but a very competent, a, an excellent playwright, and a very skilled uh, under, uh, interpreter of the dialogue, was to prove the, the template for the Abbey Theatre as it went on. Mm -hmm.